So Kevin and I are going to have a discussion with Gary that I hope you'll be joining soon. So we'll, we'll start out with some questions, but then we'll start passing the, the mics around for you. So if you have any questions then, or start thinking of some. Thanks. And just to, right. to add to the intro, Gary told me that he was just on stage before this with Sir Mix-a-Lot, who you may know as the artist who brought us Baby Got Back. So this, <laughs> this is not quite the same star power for him. But. Well, actually, this is much more comfortable for me. Um, people who are more zeros and ones. Um, now, Sir mix a lot for those who don't know, popular is the concept of um, rap, especially with regards to, uh, I, don't even, I, can't, I don't even know a clean way to say it. <laughs> Let's just call it the objectification of women that uh, okay. is quite pervasive in the field. I, yeah. I told them the plastic surgeons are thanking him everywhere. Um, yeah. uh, the other one was a, uh, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I was on stage yesterday in Austin discussing music and technology in the intersection with two people who actually made money out of it, um, which is interesting. Well, that's so, a having come from Austin, I'm happy to be here <laughs> with more of my own family. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually a really good segue into what I would say, you know, my first question for you. You're, uh, in the past, you worked with um, the rights of consumers to tape and record things at home. And yesterday, my talk, which uh, since you were in Austin, you didn't see, I talked a lot about the impact of cassettes. And then other types of, so I actually still have my cassette with me. There we go, everybody. Um, how that changed uh, the industry and how technology keeps changing the music industry and the movie industry, but the industry doesn't seem to want to embrace the technology. They want to just, I guess, let everybody else make all the money. Actually, I am going to repeat myself in the panel <laughs> yesterday because that's what I was talking about. Um, actually, I started my career way back in the late 1970s um, working uh, for the same organization I'm working for now, I was a student then, and the focus was on really the legality of home, home recording. The, uh, we just saw the prior slide of the VCR, the Betamax then, actually went to the Supreme Court, and uh, it was the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California which said that that is a, an illegal product because it records. And that was what was going on in video, and there was a battle obviously between VHS and Beta, and I, I would have a slight dispute with the prior speaker. The beta was actually better and it's still mm -hmm. popular in broadcast. Um, but the VHS did have two hours and licensed freely, which allowed it to be a market leader. In the audio world, in the music world, what was going on then was it was shocking to, to almost all of us that you had really good high fidelity sound with analog recording and all of a sudden you shifted with the introduction of the Sony Walkman to the pre-recorded cassette. The problem is the music industry didn't actually come out with a pre-recorded cassette. You had to make your own. And at the, the, what was being launched then was really the first digital product as well, which is the CD. So you could buy a CD and you could just get the songs you want in the order you wanted and you recorded them onto this rather lousy cassette. Uh, the music industry was only offering very high speed duplication. The sound was really, really bad. And they got really upset because they were actually, uh, people were making their own cassettes. And it turned out to be a big battle in music and a big battle in the uh, audio world. And the music industry did something really incredibly dumb, which is they proposed to Congress a solution which would take out of the audible spectrum a notch. It was called the CBS notch because it was their proposal. Mm -hmm. and, and we went through thousands of, of different pieces of music to, to show that actually it is audible in certain things. And of all things, it was audible in the wedding march. So you're recording, and all of a sudden, you hear this blip in the music because your, your recorder would turn off, essentially, if it heard this blip um, that it couldn't be recorded and it was it would ruin weddings and it was a great congressional hearing we just destroyed the proposal but anyway I don't know what your question was but I'm answering a different <laughs> question <laughs> yeah well that it, it worked out fine anyway so, yeah. well I, I, I you, we were talking earlier about how many lawyers in the audience can we see by a show of hands how many lawyers are actually in the audience I guess I'm right. a lawyer it's like being Jewish once you're there you're there for life so I was, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and you know versus no more science and engineering well, thank people you. yeah well, so uh, as, as I said, as you were coming up, you probably see more innovation than almost anybody on the planet. So what's got you excited in the last year? What's, uh, what's really amazing and cool? You know, I, there's so many different areas. Uh, there's a local company called uh, MC10. Um, mm -hmm. You're all shaking your head. You all know it? OK. <laughs> then I won't talk about it. No, does anyone not know it? Raise your hand. Oh, raise your hand. oh there you Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So MC10 is uh, it's actually stands for Material Company 10 by the, uh, the guy who started it. It's his 10th company. And they have a, um, basically they put electronics onto the skin. And that allows you to do all sorts of different things. And I know there's other companies in the space as well. 
But what was really, really interesting, and I've spent some time with the founder, um, is that they're having trouble selling it in the U.S. environment because of um, legal issues. The uh, Federal Food and Drug Administration, which is a barrier, and just the litigation society. And what it would do, for example, an early product is it, for, for kids or, or athletes that are out, out on the field, it could give an indicator of whether there's a possible concussion. And um, that's a real good, useful thing to have. Because it's not the first concussion that does you in, it's the second. So once you know after the first one, you should be pulled off the field. That's good. Actually, a yellow light could turn on, or a red light if it's a real serious one, a yellow light if it's a possibility. But that can't be sold in the US yet. Because uh, if it doesn't detect something and the kid's hurt, then the liability is huge. Ironically, they are selling it to the US military. Because in the Defense Department, actually, they're willing to take more risks and not in the battlefield with mines and explosions and things like that. I mean, something is better than nothing. I just, the commentary I have on it is it's very sad that we live in a society where nothing is better than something because of lawyers. I am not pro-lawyer, so I, am, I have no problem. I just actually wrote a column last night in the plane about that. So I wrote a lot of op-eds about innovation and some of the barriers are put in a way and some of the ways to get there. And our litigious society is a problem. And to give you an example of that, um, at South by Southwest, there was a trade show floor. And there was some really neat stuff. There was cloud computing companies, there was server hosters, there was all sorts of people with actually some interesting inventions. And there were some country pavilions, but there was one, there was actually a county pavilion, a county, and it was one of the largest exhibitors there. It was next to IBM and the US Postal Service and the University of Michigan. And it was Tyler, Texas. Does anyone know what Tyler, Texas is? Yeah, yeah unfortunately, Texas. some of you do. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, Texas is a community of a couple hundred thousand people. And they have, I mean, IBM has more employees than they have citizens. So how could they afford this big exhibit on the floor? Well, it's the patent troll capital of the world. You go down to Tyler, Texas as a patent troll, you know you're likely to win. The judges are favorable. The juries, they understand where their bread and butter is in little Tyler, Texas. And ironically, to make matters even worse. They had a cash machine at their exhibit where people would walk by their booth and they'd put them in this. It's like they're just taking, getting cash for doing nothing. <laughs> so patent trolls is something. We're, look, Ironic. I'm the head of a trade association of 2,200 companies, including some of the, probably you or, your, or companies you invest in. And one of our big focuses mm -hmm. is getting legislation through Congress, which would basically not eliminate, but reduce the severity of patent trolling. Because it's a, it's a company that brings, it's, it's a practice that brings tears to the eyes of a lot of CEOs I know, whether a large company or a small company. Look, at, there's a two person company that's based in Tyler, Texas. It's only two people, two lawyers. And they bought some old uh, patents and they sued Apple and they just won a few hundred million dollars in Tyler, Texas a few weeks ago. So is, is Mike Lucasio from BASF in the audience? Oh, my, are there patent trolls in the audience? If no, you are raising there's, <laughs> there's one who's very much in favor of it. Um, in favor of? of pat, he thinks patent trolls are a good thing, but let's Oh, uh, I'm sorry. So does Qualcomm, and they're a member of mine. Yeah. Well, no, there's this one guy, and you're going to have to have a <laughs> ninja battle with him later. Well, just one more question um, to follow up on that, because you mentioned uh, VHS and free licensing. And um, so I'm really interested in the maker movement, the open source hardware, software, and everything. And I hear from a lot of companies, uh, actually this, you know, this type of audience, like, well, no, we want to make money. We don't want this to be open source. And I have such a hard time saying that those aren't exclusive. So do you have any you know, rationale? Or like you, you mentioned the VHS example, but there are other, like a succinct way to say that open source is actually a great way to make money? It could be. Well, I, I think there's, it depends. It depends. Uh, as I get older, I keep saying that more. Yeah. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's a business strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously Google um, and others have decided that for them it, it will work if they, they want to get out there quickly. You want to dominate a market. If you have an ability to sell the, the razor blades, for example, you know, you give <laughs> the razors away. That, that's an old strategy. It's, um, but if you... And clearly, the beta VHS is the classic one. I mean, beta really was better technically by every objective measure. But it wasn't good. But it was Sony the one and only. They just did Sony. They didn't license it out. And, um, you know, Matsushita, what, now called Panasonic, went out to RCA. They went out to Zenith. They went out to all these company names that don't exist anymore. <laughs> um, and that was, that was different. So in today's marketplace, I think, obviously, you could just diffuse something quicker if it's open source. 
But if you have something really, really good, I mean, even an Apple, take the Apple um, iPod, I mean, I, the uh, iPhone, rather. The, there was a great battle at Apple, according to a recent book, internally, where Steve Jobs was opposed to licensing out for app development. He wanted to control everything. And he was turned around, and that, that was, in a sense, the beauty of Steve Jobs. He was willing, to, when he made a mistake, to say I was wrong. And I don't think the iPhone would be as popular today if it didn't have all essentially open source apps development. So that, that's actually a good segue because my colleague John Melnix later is going to talk about wearable electronics in the context of the ecosystems they're going to be in. So in phones, right, we have Android and uh, Apple basically, right? So it's fairly segmented. But in something like the smart home, which was a pretty hot topic at CES this year, there's so many players trying to go in. So everybody wants to own their own data. They want to control everything. They want to capture all the value. How do you see that kind of shaking out in terms of, for example, in the smart home? Well, I was going to answer your wearables question because it's early this morning. Uh, how many of you get Shelly Palmer's little blurb every day? Oh, nobody. Wow, it's a really cool thing. You should sign up. You get it? Sabina, yes. Uh, well, you should sign up for it. It's really cool. He, he referred to uh, like the, the coolest uh, app for people who are doing the quantified self, which was last year's word, but it still applies. Quantified self is that you obviously you get a lot of information about yourself and you keep track of it somehow. And uh, I, I wear a Fitbit. I got the new one. I can tell you right now that it's my uh, heart rate is 62. It's not mm -hmm. bad. Um, and, but the point is, it's right here. It has a nice app on my smartphone. But, there was a, but I saw that this app actually takes the Fitbit and all sorts of other running information also the, and, and presents it, and as Gr Shelley Palmer said, the most graphically beautiful way that he's ever seen. And this is all, I, I didn't really have the time to like start setting it up, but I, I may. Mm -hmm. um, but all of a sudden, I could have my own web page that I could open up to anyone I want or nobody, and they could see what I'm doing and where I'm going and where I've run and what places I've visited by actually tapping other apps. Mm -hmm. So the other apps are giving permission to go there, which I thought was really interesting. So this is a business strategy again. Is the more you open, the better off you are. I, the great debate that's going on, we've done some research on, on, um, on wearables, which shows that the number one concern that consumers have is not exactly, it's not the price, it's the privacy. And then they have some other concerns, which is really kind of interesting, because we do a lot of consumer research about what consumers want, and we have a... We're a nonprofit trade association, over 2,000 companies. We own and produce the international CES, but we also have these very active groups of companies that are involved with us doing in, in, by category. And one of the categories we have is health and fitness devices. And they are like every major company sitting around the table, including Apple, talking about um, what they want to do. And, and the biggest issue right now is privacy. Mm -hmm. Because you have the federal government, you have Congress, you have everyone looking at it, and obviously we think if we could do something reasonable ourselves and, um, and meet consumer needs, we're less likely to face a heavy hand of regulation. Right. So in, in the, there's the, the privacy issue and what information you get. In the home control space, Internet of Things, it's, it's a little bit different. And, and you could argue that that's a subset of Internet of Things. But the, you could argue it's a little bit different. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data, and, and there's some incompatibility in standards, mm -hmm. um, and there's a real question. You know, there's a lot of projections about the Internet of Things. I had an interesting little conversation with John Chambers. You know, he, he was like laughing, because everyone's using his number, because the, the trick in <coughs> PR is you get someone famous to say something, you get them quoted in the New York Times, and then you quote the New York Times, and all of a sudden it's, a, it's an indisputable fact. And, and, John Chambers gave an estimate for 2020 or whatever the year was, like X billion number. Yep. No one really knows. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a heck of an estimate out there. Yeah, trillions of sensors and those kinds of things, those numbers get thrown out. Yeah. I was looking at our own estimates. I mean, we, we do forecasting for five years, and I was looking at our estimate this morning for, um, uh, I think we called them, where, uh, I forgot what we called the, essentially the Google Glass. We have these really high numbers in the next few years. Well, Google's kind of tabled. Google Glass, so I, you know our numbers are wrong. I mean, we're you know if you're right in the long term, you're kind of lucky. Um, as I guess probably Lux, you guys do forecasting as well, right? We're just not lucky. We're just good. You're just always right. <laughs> yeah, you ever go back and score yourself? 
Yes, all the time. Yeah. Yes. I, quietly, sometimes. Quietly, yeah. <laughs> My market research team is always fighting with me on that issue. I said, why don't we give scores? And, but anyway, um, no, in the home control space, there's a lot of action going on, a lot of activity, because look, there's great products out there already. I mean, you know, Samsung bought this cool little company that for a few hundred dollars, like you could be watching your house no matter where you are in the world, um, and you could see whether there's a water burst or someone's walked in your house or a light's turn on, and it's easy to set up. Most people could do it themselves with a minimum level of technical proficiency, and it makes a difference. I know how my life has changed. I mean, we keep, I hate to say it, we keep firing nannies because we see what they're doing uh, with our kids <laughs> when we're not there. So you have a little police state at home, basically. Actually, yeah. uh, only in public areas, not yeah. in bathrooms or bedrooms. But anyway, I mean, the point is, is I mean, but, yeah. and they have like, my wife and I both put in a lot of hours of work and we're really forgetful. We invariably use those technologies to find out where we left the keys or where we lost something. Um, mm. It's very effective for that. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was talking to a company yesterday morning. They had a great technology. that You put it on, under your floor and your carpet and, and peop, you could monitor your elderly mother and just make sure she's gotten out of bed that day. It'll, it'll see if there's pressure or if she's fallen and it'll send you an alert. I mean, there's... The range of technology, primarily, and in, in I think everyone in this audience knows why this has happened. Um, it's basically sensing devices have gotten sensors, which maybe some of you make, has gotten really cheap. And a lot of them gotten really cheap because we sold over a billion telephones worldwide. And, and these little tiny electromechanical devices, MEMS, mm -hmm. are, are phenomenally inexpensive. And very clever people put them together with clever ways, with algorithms. and. And they're doing a lot with it. And I think we're still beginning here. Yeah. I mean, there's so much out there. Well, so uh, to build on what you were saying about the, the carpet sensors and, and the cameras finding, help you find your keys, I mean, if you had a, a camera that could see that your mother had just fallen too, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways you can solve a lot of these different problems. So do you see, um, do you see the, the number of, of solutions still expanding right now, or is it kind of peaking and it's going to start consolidating and we're going to get the equivalent of like, you know, Windows or something else that becomes the one interface for everything? I don't see one interface. I, what I see is, for example, some people that are concerned about privacy would be mm -hmm. prefer something in the carpet rather than have a camera out there. Mm -hmm. So if you're a building an assisted living facility, um, having cameras in the room I don't think is going to work. Mm -hmm. But having sensing devices about whether someone's in bed or on the floor would sell. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it, it depends on the use function, and, and the privacy concern seems to wax and wane. Um, and I think there are solutions coming. Like, so when the, the credit card was first introduced, I think actually there was a really good law passed by Congress that said, you know, if you're concerned about people ripping you off, you'll only be responsible for $50. So now most people don't care about being ripped off with their credit card. I mean, it's, it's identity theft that becomes more of an issue, and it's privacy about what you're buying. Now, as we see devices, I, you know, now I realize that my assistant can track wherever I am because she knows my passwords mm -hmm. um, and, and follows my smartphone around. And now my smartphone also can tell whether I'm very active or not and, and where I am. I mean, it's, there's a lot of information being gathered. But I think that concerns about privacy have been around for 15, 20 years now, and yet we keep buying this technology. Some people are, have definitely become, I don't want any technology, but it's a tiny minority. Because the services and the value you're getting are so grand and great and promising. Like, do I really care if someone knows my heartbeat or my physical stuff? I'm human, you know, so what? I don't really care. Like, you know, it's just the way I, when I feel like I have a little bit of money and I really want a good suit, I'll tell a tailor all my measurements. And I'll sacrifice my privacy for convenience. I sometimes feel I'd be perfectly comfortable walking through an airport naked if I could just not have to go through security. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really care about private. I'm not that yeah. private <laughs> because I write a lot and some of it's personal. Yeah. I don't, it, to me, that's less important than getting what I want done. Mm -hmm. Other people, privacy is like the only most important thing in their life. But mm -hmm. So to that point, the study you guys did where you, privacy was number one, the big bottleneck, how much do you think if that is People know they should say that, but do they really, is that really going to impact the adoption of some of these things because of the, what you just pointed out, that some people are like you? I, I mean, well, I would guess let's most be people. honest. So, so I assume every one of you has, uh, has a wireless device or a computer, and you've gone to websites, 
and you've clicked past the privacy policy without even looking, reading it. You say, I agree. How many of you clicked past, I agree, in the last 48 hours? Just by show. All right, most of you. There you go. Here's so what does that tell you? If you want yeah. something, you're not going to, you don't care. You, you have to trust the website. Now, you know, in an ideal world, there'd be some standard out there without 50 pages of legalese that says, you know, we're, we're a tier one privacy. We have tier two privacy, you know, or something like that, where everyone would understand. Um, and that's a useful service that perhaps government could perform. I know we've actually looked at doing it. It's not easy to do. Uh, and that's what, like, why do you go, I was going to give the example of McDonald's, but it's not a good, like Starbucks. Or why do you go somewhere, anywhere in the world? You go because you know the brand and the brand trust you trust, and it conveys everything about it in a predictable experience. That's what you need online, is you need some brands that say this is, or maybe some entrepreneur will say, I certify this as, you know, A-class privacy, and that's all you need to know. Mm -hmm. There's a business idea for somebody. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it seems like um, it's the concern of the age. You know, in the past, it might have been food safety or, you know, some other type of concern that uh, we just want to make sure we have that allayed. But are, are the things that you see going into the future, like at, at some point, if we do get over privacy, what are some of the next, you know, social concerns or uh, social goals that you think people will have? Well, you know, you raise a good point. So it's the concern of the age. So I think what uh, the Snowden revelations had an impact that was pretty big um, because people were really, really upset. But there's, there's different levels of that. And traveling around the world, boy, they, they, they're even more concerned than the U.S. is about Snowden because they, it hasn't reflected well in the U.S. But there's two things. One is what the government is doing, and two is what people in private can be, how they can be using your information and what the obligation is. So what the government is doing in, to me, there's been mass hysteria about it. You know, what the government, all they were doing is, is basically using algorithms to look at who, bad guys who call people who call people and mm -hmm. looking at their cell phone you know, numbers and seeing if there's a connection. That's all that was going on. But there was mass hysteria in response to that, and now there's efforts in Congress and still in government to just block it off. And like, even you take the most liberal person in the world, like our president, when he was in Congress, was concerned. Once you have the weight of the presidency and the responsibility to keep the American people safe, your whole view of life changes. And I don't blame mm -hmm. him for that. So he's protecting that, in a sense, the, all sorts of things to do, uh, national security. On the other hand, private companies like my members are really affected by that because now you know, hosting a cloud in the US is a little bit of a challenge. It's, you're less likely to get the sale abroad. Mm -hmm. And so there's concerns there. So the privacy issue has taken its own life on. Mm -hmm. Another issue is just taking its own life on. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out to conceptualize this. Is like, it's kind of like mass hysteria in a way. And the facts mm -hmm. don't matter. The prospects of it. Is that what's happened in Washington is this concept of net neutrality. How many of you have heard of the open internet or net neutrality? Most of you. So that was a big deal uh, because it, it, the tech industry, after like years and years of saying, you know, hands off the internet, it's doing great without the government, did it rapid switcheroo, thanks to John Oliver, who, who did the funniest piece in history about, <laughs> how, I mean, how many of you saw John Oliver? This is an exercise and raise your hands. I know you're not asleep. All right, about, about a fifth of you saw John Oliver's like 14 minute thing about net neutrality. That generated several million um, contacts to Washington and turned around the President of the United States, who turned around the Chairman of the FCC, and all of a sudden now the internet is subject to 500 new rules, subject just to who's at the FCC, and it's caused this huge consternation in Congress, and it's just kind of the most amazing thing. And it was all one company pushing for it, Netflix. Netflix was upset that they were being tweaked by uh, Comcast and say, you're using up one third of, the, of, the, the, uh, of our broadband capability. You know, you should pay a little bit if you really want to use it. And they convinced everyone this is a good thing. And now, and now Netflix, the CFO, said, well, we didn't really want all this regulation. You know, it's, it's crazy. So the, the, there's mass hysteria that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the, uh, so net neutrality, um, privacy, even the, the home taping stuff, all these things I think come down to a balance of power between sort of you know, small individual actors, consumers, and, and larger corporations or government. And um, kind of an, you could almost say, legally arbitrary decision as to who's going to get that shift. You make a, a Supreme Court decision pro or against home recording, you know, and, and that basically, again, it, it, it shifts the dynamic in the industry. So the um, net neutrality is certainly a good example of that. There are things like, you know, uh, can private individuals have strong crypto? And there's a lot of other things that hit on a lot of other areas. So again, kind of going back to where innovation's headed and, and what you see next. And by the way, 
I would love to get more comments right. from the, the audience after this or questions. You know, what are the next new frontiers where we're going to have this sort of consolidation of, of power? And I think the, the smart home is a good example where people think, well, what if Apple owns everything in your home? Or what if you know, Tesla knows everything about your car? What, where do you see the next uh, battle? Well, here? first of all, I think if you want to play off the privacy thing, which I think is a real concern, at least as research shows it, it the companies that, that position themselves as trusted will have a leg up competitively. If you can convince consumers that you, they could trust you. And that, it, it, by the way, it's also automobiles. Sure. On the other hand, you know, where's the battle? I think we're going in the wrong direction some ways. For example, I mentioned Google Glass. Well, to me, the benefit of Google Glass that I was really excited about when it was, when it was first launched was it, it had facial recognition in there. I mean, I meet thousands of people, and if I remember two names, it's a big deal. <laughs> so the fact that I could see someone and know how I knew them was very exciting to me. And, and I have a family with a history of Alzheimer's, and, and you know, for Alzheimer's, it was a big deal. That was withdrawn from Google Glass before they even went out with the test markets, because privacy advocates raised concern, and Google withdrew. But yet, we are evolving the technology now, which I, and I was in Israel and Tel Aviv looking at some things. I mean, there's some amazing stuff out there. With, uh, it's not only facial recognition. You could tell within 30 seconds of someone talking, or even on television, looking at micro twitches and things like that and measuring the voice, whether or not they're telling the truth. You could tell so much whether their heartbeat rate is, what their emotion is, what they're likely. We are heading to an area where, you know, we're not right where, we, where you, you could read people's minds, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. To me, that's a little bit exciting because I'm in Washington, D.C., and I would love to do that to politicians, you know. <laughs> But I know that there's other ramifications, and you know, and um, then technologies will be, will be evolved with cloaking, and, and you know, maybe we'll all wear like Muslim-type cloaks after a while, just so people can't reveal that. But but and so there'll always be counterways of dealing with stuff that comes along. But there is benefits, and there's always a trade-off. You know, if you want more information, you want better health care, you want better water, you want better agriculture, reduced hunger, all these major problems in society. It's the people in this room that are solving these huge worldwide problems in society. It's not just about better entertainment or even better education or inf information anymore. It's about solving the biggest challenges in the world. And we're, start we're starting to solve them rap rather rapidly. So 20 or 30 years from now, the problems we're talking about today won't be in existence. They'll be solved. There will be, it's like talking about polio almost. Yeah. So, so what was evolving? Well, let me give you an example. Today, if you want to buy something, you have two choices. You could go to the store. Or and pick it up and bring it home, or you can go online or call somebody and it will be delivered to your home by a, you know UPS or FedEx or United States Postal Service if you're in the U.S. or if you're in different countries, obviously other delivery services. We'll have three more choices in a few years. We'll have um, UAVs or, or uh, uh, drones. Drones can deliver to your house. And that's clearly being done. Even in developing countries now, drones are being used to deliver medicine um, and medical testing tests to get to those last few miles over a mountain or over muddy, um, impassable roads. And, and you could daisy chain drones. So it could be actually not just a, a few kilometers. It could be multiple kilometers. And that's happening quickly. In urban cities like here, you know, trying to get through the Boston traffic, even at oh, close to midnight last night was tough. You could do it top of building to top of building deliveries. And, and you could cut back on congestion. So drones will be one way. The second will be driverless cars. Um, and there's so many aspects of driverless cars. Just at breakfast this morning, someone was talking about, you know, if there's almost zero accidents, you don't really need all that safety stuff built into cars or the heavy metals or all these things. If, you, if there's 100% safety, or, um, cars will be di built differently. They'll be owned differently. Uh, they may not be owned at all by people, if you could always have one. And the third way that um, people will get a product in their home is 3D printing, which is the ironic thing about 3D printing is the major it's so old, the, ma the major patents have expired, but there's, it's the composites now that are going into it that are rapidly changing. Look, the space station just a few months ago, instead of, they had a tool break. And instead of you know, the, the multi-month period of getting a tool up to the space station, they, they, they made it themselves, mm -hmm. which is cool. So 3D printing is absolutely, you know, it's another trend which is absolutely huge. And, and obviously, robotics are, are coming. I mean, that's just a gradual thing up there, and, and they'll do a lot of different things. So you want to ask me a question? Yeah, well, you're just saying all the things that we've spent a lot of time on, drones, robotics. Oh, I'm sorry. Things. No, 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 right. which is great. The segue I was wondering is how you've seen the definition of, 
electronics change over the years? Because you go to CES now, you've got, you've got the cars, you've, you've got autonomous vehicles, drones, all these things before. I imagine that's been a huge shift over the... Yeah, we figured out about 15 years ago that we, we run the internet and on the International Consumer Electronics Show, which is the largest event of any type in the world. It's an innovation event. And we had over 170,000 people. And it's not open to the public. We had 170,000 people there. And how many of you have been to the CES? Not enough. I'd say about a third of you. That's good. Uh, well, you're all invited because that's where innovation, you could see it. And don't get confused by the name electronics. It's actually not called the Consumer Electronics Show. It's called the International CES. And that's intentional because 15 years ago we figured out, first of all, that the number of retailers that could come to CES could, could fit in this room mm -hmm. and, and just in this aisle and have 95% of the market. So we had to expand and we expanded internationally and we, we decided to expand what the definition of electronics is. So it's anything, and we also realized there's a tremendous convergence going on. Mm -hmm. And we figured out it would be in the automobile and it would be elsewhere um, with, with devices. We actually predicted the uh, tablet. We said there's a room for a middle screen market. And um, there were some, that's what a lot of things Apple did. There were people who did it first and didn't do that well. Um, <clears throat> certainly, the, uh, look, the Kindle was a middle screen market. And others that, that came out there, well, Kindle was good, but there was a lot of losers before that. But the point is, is that there's a lot of things that are predictable that are coming in terms of technologies. And there's, there's, you know, there's definitely predicting, you know, the flat screen television. We were really excited about HGTV and flat screen television. And now a 4K Ultra we've been pushing and talking about. Mm -hmm. And soon it'll be 8K uh, Ultra. Um, and bendable TV and portable TV and screens everywhere. And if I were representing the wallpaper makers of the world, I'd be a little nervous right now. <laughs> yeah. A lot of new technologies coming out that way. So a lot of trends are coming. And it's not, you know, Electronics is just part of everything now, and, and you know between Moore's law and, and materials, which you guys know about more than I do, uh, we're headed towards things where we're getting a lot of information, a lot of data, and it's going to be everywhere. How do, how do you, as you guys think of questions, please start raising your does hand. Anybody, I'll, does I'll, anybody have a? I'll one pose a, one more follow up real quick, in that, given something like automotive, there's going to be a balance of power shift coming. Right, you've got the electronics guys, and then they got OEMs. And at some point, perhaps there's a shift in the way people move around, the way cars get made, the electronic content in them. Do you see a significant changes in those industries in terms of the dynamics? A lot of people here supply into, say, the car industry. I mean, do you see anything really shifting in some of these established industries? Well, you know, I start with the assumption that the goal, whether it's 15 or 30 years, is the driverless cars being ubiquitous. Um, so the question is, how do you get there? And there is actually a roadmap, to use an expression, that the Department of, U.S. Department of Transportation has, which is pretty good. Um, so one of the things is active collision avoidance. So active collision avoidance is a mandatory feature in every car. It means a hell of a lot of opportunity there, because that's a multi-billion dollar market. Uh, so I, I, getting there is, is fairly predictable, um, although difficult, and sometimes we under state how difficult it is mm -hmm. to all the things that have to happen in place and the transition. I mean, personally, I'm engaged in this because we're in a battle with the Department of Transportation, frankly, because their view is the only thing that matters is safety. And therefore, every product that you can carry into a car should be made unusable as soon as you get into the car. And, and I appreciate the, the, the fact that our products are killing people when they're using them to text while drive, but I don't think that's the solution, especially if you're a as my wife is a, is a doctor who's on call um, and a mother who has a babysitter, is where she's not going to turn off her phone because she's driving alone. And that's so, so there are um, real issues with that. And, and then there's, um, so there, so there's, there's a pathway to get there and there's an intermediate steps. Um, and there are, but there are other things like, I don't, what I like, so uh, the head of Ford, Mark Field, spoke at CES and he gave a vision that Ford had about how, it's how their vision is of, of, of what kind of company they will be, which is really, really interesting, not what you would have expected. And at the same time, Mercedes-Benz, I had the, the joy of driving out in this really cool concept car onto stage. And, but I was shocked to hear the head of Mercedes Worldwide say a few minutes later, he says, one thing, Mercedes will never introduce a car where the driver cannot take over. You know, I. He's going to be wrong uh, if they're around 25 or 50 years from now. I mean, that's, look, driverless cars are going to do a great job for people that are uh, older or disabled or kids or, or intoxicated or, you know, 
marijuana legalization laws. These things are <laughs> providing all sorts I, there's, of opportunities. There's a virtuous spiral there. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, Pop it's for that. This is the reality. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, but I don't know if any yeah. one kind like like Tesla's pretty cool, but there'll be someone else. There's always someone else who comes along and does things better, and it could be in a way that we can't anticipate. I think we have a member of ours that has a two-wheel car, and their frustration is is that they have to go, you know, deal with all these tests made for four-wheel cars. Mm -hmm. And so they're having trouble getting into market. There's a question. Yeah, I was going to say, so could you say uh, your name and what company you're from, too? I don't think this is on. There we go. Uh, Luke Adriansen's from uh, Comsco. We do telecom infrastructure and stuff. Um, uh, yesterday, we heard a lot about um, uh, change and kind of the need to uh, continue to evolve and stuff. And if you look at CES over the last decade, all the new things that have been introduced from automobiles to, to drones and uh, 3D printing, wearables, um, uh, fitness devices, et cetera. What, what's coming in 2016? What's going to be the big splash that's going to be the unique thing, that the draw, if you will, to CES in 2016? You know, that's a, that's a question that journalists always ask me, and I've been asked this so many times, you think I could have a good answer. So for 2015, I kept getting that question, and I said, well, the whole, really, the big splash is a phenomenal array of different innovations. And after a while, if you look at the coverage of the 2015 show, that's where it ended up. There's so many things happening. For example, in the wearable space, it wasn't just on the devices that, that measure you that, you that you could put on and attach to your body. There was, now we've shifted to where they could go into clothes and, and materials that you wear. And there was even a, a company that had a, it's a sensitive subject, but it was an internal um, device for women, in, insert the cervix, and it would tell them when they are most likely to conceive. So it did everything that a, that a device that I wear on my wrist would do only more precisely. And, um, and for women that are trying to conceive, instead of having a four hour window of hurry up, honey, they had a 48 hour window, which is life changing for people. And actually, they, and I was talking to the woman who's president of the company, she said they, the Vatican was all over them as well, because it's, it's considered legitimate. But, but the point is, is that we have a long ways to go still in a lot of different categories. So in agriculture, there's more and more you know, measuring the soil telling you what to do, what to grow, how to grow it, be efficient, use water. Um, with uh, water purification, I mean, there's a, you've heard some of the things you, you heard there. These are the fundamental problems that are plaguing society. Uh, with healthcare, I mean, there's so much out there now where we have a way to go. I mean, the biggest problem, not the biggest, one of the biggest problems in the United States is diabetes, uh, you know, caused in part by the fact that we're fat. Um, but the diabetics have so many healthcare needs and, and they're so expensive for the system, but they have, tr and, but it can be controlled. It can be monitored, but you still need to look at blood. But the problem is, is that the people, diabetics generally, um, many of them do not take their blood as often as they should. It leads to other problems. It leads to diabetic retinopathy. It leads to amputational limbs. It leads to all sorts of major healthcare problems. Well, you should be able to measure blood soon without taking a, a blood sample outside. You could see the viscosity of the blood. Um, and that, that'll be life changing. So what, what's the biggest trend or change? We have. We have 3,300 different companies exhibiting in 2.25 million net square feet of exhibit space. Nobody saw the whole show. Uh, there's so many different categories of innovation going on there that I wish I had, a, if anyone could tell me how to answer that question, <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to know how to, I can't. Okay. We have time for probably two more questions. If we'll get Hold it. We'll on. We'll bring you a microphone. One more breath and mm -hmm. you have a microphone. Hi, this was really interesting. I was have always thought that there would be a kind of alternate internet that was really branded around privacy. That banks, some large, um, you know, like Amazon, might be on. That they would sort of gang together and create their own private, really secure alternate, like you know, HTTPSS or something. And I'm wondering if you think that that would ever happen. You know, I'm chiding myself because I have never thought of that. Uh, that's a great idea. And I'm, I'm sure they have thought about it. They, you know, banks have actually done pretty well. Uh, I mean, they're really probably as, as focused as defense uh, portions of governments in terms of the internet. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But I will say, when you said that, I am the, the sad thing that's happening with the internet's evolution is that the countries are putting up barriers around the internet, physical 
or technical barriers. I mean, obviously China is doing it, um, and, and it's every it's a natural inclination of a government to try to protect itself. The United States has taken, and I'm on a State Department uh, committee uh, of advisors in this area, uh, and it's, we've taken a unanimous position. Congress was unanimous, on, and this is one of the areas the U.S. has been unanimous on that this is a really bad idea. Um, and there's two reasons they're doing it. One is governments want to control what happens in their country, like China is the best example. I don't think that needs much explanation. But another is that this is what used to happen in a lot of uh, developing countries is the government would make a lot of money from interconnection fees for long distance telephone service. And all of a sudden they saw that money go away. So they want to charge their citizens to access internet sites outside their country, which would be horrible. So, um, and, and then the Snowden revelations came out, and now this is the big push. You know, um, certainly Brazil is talking, others, everyone's talking about creating their own barriers, and that would be really, really bad. Um, but, I, but yours is a good answer. The, well, I guess it's a virtual private network is what it is on an industry-wide basis. And I, it might exist for all I know. Yeah. No, I can say that I know people are looking at just, we need a new internet. This one's too, you know, clogged up with ads and spies and we'll just make something new and it'll be more inherently robust. So there is talk about those types of things. And cool. I think had the net neutrality decision gone the other way, that, you, that would have absolutely accelerated it into the market. Because the people that are developing things look at AT&T and Comcast as, as part of the problem. So really? Yeah. Well, I have Verizon Fios, and mm -hmm. you know, I was spending some time this week with the Google people, the Google Fiber people, and you know, there's there's other, there's like several hundred companies doing mm -hmm. stuff in that area that are not AT and Com, Comcast, and Verizon. Yeah. I, although I, they're all members of mine too. No, I, I don't know if Comcast isn't, yeah. but Verizon, I mean, Fios is like it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. One last question. Anybody? Yes, right here. And please uh, say your name and what company you're from, so we know yes, who you are and we can track you later. Is there anything else I should say? Oh, Hun Kwon, I'm from San Gubang. Well, it sounds like you are uh, quite aware of a uh, pattern of uh, 3D uh, printing. Uh, I sometimes thought about uh, this pattern system we have. It's actually. Uh, slow down the technology. Like uh, after expiring all those uh, printer patterns and materials patterns, now people are extremely active. Uh, have you thought about, uh, I don't know, this uh, current pattern system and uh, uh, are there any alternatives and uh, new directions uh, to take? So the patent system, you know, the, the beauty of patents is in the United States Constitution, it's actually they use the word patents, which is really strange because not too many constitutions do. So patents have been around for a while, and, and, and the patent term really hasn't changed much. And you want to compare that to the copyright term. When uh, 200 years ago, the patent and copyrights had equal terms, and now a copyright term is about, well, it's a life of a person plus 50 years, so it's, it could be a lot. It could be, you know, eight to ten times more. But the patent term itself is one that it's pretty much accepted. It's a, little, it's a little bit problematic, honestly, is we use the same patent laws and terms to cover things like pharmaceuticals, where there's a pretty crisp, clear molecular structure that's well-defined, and the interference or is, is defined. And then you use it with complex electronics products. And one of the great debates going on is how you value and license a patent. Um, what are reasonable and non-discriminatory terms if you're licensing it and it's part of a standard. And there's a lot of patent licensing issues. And for years, the, my world of electronics and consumer electronics evolved really rapidly because it was just a history of cross-licensing patents, especially among major companies. You know, with the Samsung, Apple things, it's gotten a little um, less friendly, honestly. And then with the patent trolls, it's gotten just downright ugly. Uh, so do, am I thinking about a better system? Yeah, um, I'm actively trying to change the system. In fact, uh, President Obama in his State of the Union address last year talked about patents and how the system is broken. The House of Representatives on an on almost unanimous vote last year voted to change the patent system. The Senate was about to pass the legislation. But along came then Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid who called up the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee who was ready to act on it and said, I'm not going to move this legislation. 
And the theory is, is that the lawyers uh, who contribute a phenomenal amount of money and, and the estimated loss due to patent trolls is $150 billion a year in the U.S. have basically made financial contributions to the Democratic Party that are overwhelming. So the effort now is to get that changed. There's a member of Congress who owns a several patents who's led the charge in this. Um, his name is Darrell Isa. And I, he, he actually now chairs the committee that has jurisdictional oversight over patents. And uh, he used to be chairman of, the, of my board, frankly, because he built up a company. You might have heard his voice, because he's the car security company. He says, stand back from the car. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's Viper. Um, yeah. And he sold the company. But, but he's, uh, he's, he's lightning fixed on changing mm. the patent system in the United States. I mean, but the, but there's some debates around the periphery, you know, first to file, first to invent. And, and the, the court system has gotten crazy, as I mentioned, Tyler, Texas. But yeah, it should change. If, if you have any ideas, please talk to me afterwards. I'd love to. It's a very, very complex area. My view of the world is what the role of government is, is that the government should set rules. They should set the rules, and they should be clear so everyone can follow them. You shouldn't be fighting over ambiguity in terms of what they mean. And then everyone can just play by the same rules, and business can innovate and progress. But we are now literally choking on ambiguity and length of rules, whether it's the healthcare law or the banking laws. or you know, the, Now these 1,000-page laws are being written. And, and the agencies are like, I mean, you're talking about like you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of rules now that we have to follow. And it's very difficult to innovate in that environment. OK. Well, um Please uh, join me in thanking Gary for uh, for coming uh, and being on our panel. We've covered a lot of appreciate that. So, uh, is this, I hope this is what you were. Yeah, perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you.